Gaming has advanced tremendously over the past decades, allowing us to immerse ourselves deeply into the worlds of our favorite characters. Spider-Man games in particular have evolved quite a bit in that time, giving us the ability to seamlessly web-swing through a fully detailed New York City in full Spider-Man glory. But today, in honor of Marvel's 40th gaming anniversary, I want to take a look at where it all began, which was in 1982, with Spider-Man and Marvel's first ever video game, Spider-Man on the Atari 2600, published by Parker Brothers. Parker Brothers themselves had been around since the 1800s and were primarily a board game company, with a hand in popular games such as Monopoly and Clue. In the early 1980s though, they expanded into video games and managed to obtain licenses for popular franchises like Star Wars and Marvel. At this time, gaming was still in its infancy and was handled quite differently compared to how it is today. For starters, only one designer was in charge of each game. In this case, Laura Nikolic was Atari Spider-Man's sole designer and developer. Laura created all the in-game artwork and programmed all the gameplay. The only thing she requested help on were the game's sound effects and music. So it's pretty impressive that one developer handled pretty much everything back then, and I think it's even more exciting to see a female developer at the helm, with game development being such a male-dominated industry, especially in the 80s. Games were developed pretty quickly compared to today as well, with Laura mentioning that it took her about six months to fully complete Atari Spider-Man. She also describes some hurdles to get this game to the point that we see it today, including having to convince others on how it should play. As you can see in the gameplay, Spider-Man scales the building vertically in an attempt to get to the top of it. However, the marketing department at Parker Brothers originally wanted this game to scroll horizontally. Laura felt that scrolling horizontally would lead to a stuttery performance, which she describes during an interview with the YouTube channel Spider-Man Crawl Space. You know, the biggest thing that I had to fight with is that they wanted a horizontally scrolling game, mm. and it was much easier to make it vertical, because at that time, you had, if you're going to do horizontal, like if you look at the uh, Star Wars with the uh, the Ice Walkers. Uh huh. That was horizontal. Yeah, yeah. horizontal, but it's very jerky because mm. you do it pixel by pixel. You had to do it four pixels at a time. So you can go vertical one pixel or one line at a time. Oh. If you go horizontal, it jumps by four pixels each time simply because it was there was nothing there. It was very rudimentary. Surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, Spider-Man's webbing was one of the most challenging aspects of this game, and the way it was pulled off was actually revolutionary for its time. Honestly, this goes way over my head, but Laura used a DDA algorithm for Spidey's webs, which stands for Digital Differential Analyzer, something that hadn't been done before in gaming. That's probably why Spider-Man swinging in this game is its standout feature, and I found it to be enjoyable both visually and during gameplay, especially when Spider-Man would swing diagonally. In that same interview with Spider-Man Crawl Space, Laura also describes each step of how the game was created. Well, you start out with brainstorming with your colleagues and mm. you, you decide. And then what you do is you put up the background first. You get, I got the building up. Mm -hmm. Then I got it so I could scroll up and down the building. And then I put then I worked on the web and then I put Spider-Man in. And then I had to work with, you know, perfecting the, the, um, the swinging and the scrolling simultaneously. But after six months of development, the game released just in time for Christmas of 1982 and sold as a new release for $40 per copy. It sold pretty well too, ranking in Billboard's top 10 selling games that holiday. It's not too surprising either, because it seems that Parker Brothers did a good job marketing the game. Easily the most famous advertisement is the commercial that aired, featuring a fully costumed Spider-Man and Green Goblin. <laughs> Try to get up there in time, Spider-Man! <laughs> Watch me cut my web, Goblin! Watch yourself fall, Silk Slinger! Can't stop the bombs in time! If I don't get you webhead, my diagnosis will! Holy hell! And you're running out of fluid! <laughs> Is this more action than even Spider-Man can handle? <laughs> Spider-Man, a video game from Parker Brothers, the ones to beat. Looking back at it now, that's actually a pretty solid Green Goblin costume. The ads that featured in magazines and comics were pretty similar to this commercial as well, often featuring the Green Goblin taunting Spider-Man's gameplay skills. There were also ads that were made to look like comics, one of which features a story where the Green Goblin uses this game as a way to test Spider-Man. If Spider-Man fails to defuse the bombs in the game, then Goblin will win and prove himself as the superior one. Ultimately, Spider-Man wins due to the fact that he's actually been playing this game a lot recently as a way to improve his reflexes. So basically, if you want to be like Spider-Man, play the Parker Brothers Spider-Man game. There's another comic within Blip Magazine, which shows Green Goblin cruising around New York City when he encounters kids playing the new Spider-Man game. 
They're having a lot of fun in it, exclaiming how Spider-Man is the best and always beats Green Goblin. So Goblin blows up their TV and heads to the Parker Brothers headquarters to punish the president of the company. When he arrives, he learns that this is also the moment that Parker Brothers is holding a convention to promote their new Spider-Man game, and that Spider-Man himself is in attendance. This leads Goblin to attack Spider-Man, and the two duke it out in the convention until Spider-Man knocks him out with a display board of himself. Goblin is then taken to jail, where he finds that the prison has just installed a new recreation facility, which includes the new Spider-Man game. Spider-Man was also on the cover of that same Blip magazine issue, which displayed him playing his own game. My favorite aspect of this magazine issue, though, is that it contains an article written about a time when Stan Lee, Spider-Man, and Green Goblin played the game together with some kids. It's great seeing Stan promoting the game back in the 80s, and I think this was a really fun advertisement. Like the ads, the game's instruction manual is equally entertaining to read. Back before the days of in-game tutorials, the instruction manual was the primary way you got all the details about a game's story and gameplay mechanics. Thanks to digital archives, we can digitally flip through an old instruction manual to see what it includes. Insider details about controls and gameplay mechanics, along with some dialogue between Spider-Man and Goblin that give us a rough idea of what the story and objective of the game is. New York City. At the mercy of the Green Goblin. He's booby-trapped the city's skyscrapers with super bombs. I must save the city now. But the Goblin will try to stop my every move. Criminals and time bombs, even the Green Goblin himself, stand between me and the super bombs. Can I save the city in time? Let's see what your superhero powers can do against me, Spider-Man. I'm far more dangerous than you think, Web Slinger. This is about it as far as story in the manual, but their dialogue gives you a good sense of the general story and what your goal is in this game. Spider-Man needs to reach the top of this tower to defuse the super bomb the Goblin has placed there. By the way, the super bomb is this staticky looking square at the top of the tower. To defuse it, you just need to touch it, which takes you into the next level which is basically the same except now the building is taller, a different color, and contains more hazards to stop you. These hazards are criminals in the windows, and smaller bombs that will detonate if they're left sitting long enough. Despite Spider-Man being a wall crawler, his only way to scale the building is by spinning a web and climbing it up. However, if the webbing makes contact with the criminals, they'll cut the web line and send you falling, requiring you to shoot another web to catch yourself before hitting the ground. Green Goblin is also present and is even more threatening. Not only can he cut your web line, but he'll also knock you down if you make contact with him. You need to be skillful with your web shots too, because Spidey's webs can only attach to the main structure of the tower. If you attempt to attach a web to a window, the web will slip and Spider-Man will fall. I know it's not entirely comic accurate, since Spider-Man's webs do indeed stick to windows, but that's not the case in this game. Although I guess you could just headcanon that all the windows are open. Regardless, you have to be precise with where on the building you attach your webs. To add to the challenge, Spider-Man also has a limited supply of web fluid. So if you run out of web fluid while scaling the building, you'll free fall to the bottom with no way of rescuing yourself. It's a fairly intense death scene too, watching Spider-Man plummet to the ground along with the sound effect of him hitting the pavement. Honestly, it's a little funny too though, and I call it a death scene, but Spidey's probably alive. We've seen him survive some pretty hard landings in the past. While we're talking about sound effects, I want to play some of them so you can get a sense of this game's sound design. For example, when you start the game, you get a cute little musical tune as it begins. Capturing criminals and defusing bombs also gives some satisfying sound effects. Then of course is the webbing itself, which almost sounds like the web line is tearing through your speakers. I wouldn't call it a satisfying sound effect, but I think it works for the game. Speaking of the webbing though, the web fluid isn't entirely comic accurate since it depletes based on how long you're taking to get up the tower, not based on how many webs you're actually using. So it's basically a timer since it will continue to deplete even if you're just staying stationary on the wall. You can replenish some of your web fluid by capturing the criminals that are hanging out of the windows and by touching bombs to defuse them. Capturing criminals and defusing bombs are also how you get points in this game, and you get bonus points if you reach the top and defuse the super bomb. Even though the webbing isn't entirely comic accurate, I like the gameplay loop of trying to get to the top of the tower as quickly as possible, while also attempting to keep my web fluid replenished. I also like that my score was tied to how many criminals and bombs I defused, which gave me incentive to go out of my way and grab them if I had the opportunity. I also felt that being on a timer was a good choice, since it makes Green Goblin more threatening. 
Your goal is to rush up the tower as quickly as you can, but if you're not careful, Goblin will knock you down and slow your progress, so you're forced to play more cautiously around him while the timer ticks away. In the first level, he'll just glide at the top from side to side, so he's not too tricky to bypass. But as you progress through the levels, he'll start to patrol other parts of the tower, so you'll encounter him more often. I enjoyed Green Goblin's presence, and it led to some fun last minute moves as I tried to get past him and reach the top of the tower with only a small amount of web fluid left. During that interview with Spider-Man Crawlspace, Laura Nikolic was asked if any other villains were considered instead of Green Goblin, but she states that he was always the only intended villain. The main reason he was chosen was due to his ability to fly, but also because he was a popular Spider-Man villain, despite being dead in the comics at the time of the game's release. Even though he was dead at the time, Green Goblin remained an iconic foe for Spider-Man, and Goblin's final couple issues were a big reason for that. Those issues were part of the The Night That Gwen Stacy Died arc. In that comic, Goblin knocks Gwen Stacy off a bridge, and Spider-Man attempts to rescue her by attaching a webline to her. However, the sudden stop causes her neck to break, killing her instantly. With Gwen Stacy dead, Spider-Man wants vengeance, and battles Green Goblin in a warehouse. During the battle, Green Goblin attempts to impale Spider-Man with his glider, but Spider-Man dodges and Goblin accidentally impales himself with it, killing him. Or so we think at least, as we learn Goblin actually survives this incident, which is detailed in a comic from the 90s titled The Osborne Journal. Gwen Stacy was a big moment in Spider-Man comics though, and helped cement Green Goblin as one of Spider-Man's most iconic villains and greatest rivals, so it makes sense to use him in the game. As a further example of his pop culture status, four years after this game, Goblin was even featured in the 1986 Stephen King film, Maximum Overdrive, where trucks come to life and terrorize humans. One of the trucks displays the face of the Green Goblin on it, which is a pretty fun and random inclusion. That's about all that's good in that movie though. I watched it and I recommend you never do, but it's still fun to see Goblin in it. But anyway, I want to wrap up my thoughts on the gameplay of Atari Spider-Man, which I found to be surprisingly fun. I even found myself becoming incredibly focused at times as I tried to perfectly time my webbing to attach to a certain part of the tower. Some moments became very tense as well if I missed a web shot or got knocked down and had to quickly recover before hitting the ground. As you would expect with a game of this age, the gameplay can be kind of finicky at times as you have limited control over the directions you can shoot your webs as well as positioning yourself to try and claim criminals and bombs. I found this to be especially tricky whenever I'd reached the top of the tower and had to make contact with the super bomb to defuse it. You're given very limited room to maneuver Spider-Man, so it can be a little challenging to get the web in the right spot and swing Spider-Man onto it. So it's not hard to see this game being sort of a rage game at times if your webs aren't connecting like you need them to and you're getting knocked down a lot. Still, I really enjoyed my time with this game, and I think if I had to score it, I'd give it an 8 out of 10. It's a fun game and I really like the web swinging mechanic. It's also a fun game to mess around with to see how far you can make it into the levels and how much of a high score you can obtain. I was still a decade away from being born at the time of this game's release, so I can't speak to how I might have liked it back in the 80s, but if this was something that I had on my Game Boy or on my phone in my younger years, I could totally see it being something that I would pull out to kill time with for fun. However, I don't think the gameplay is addicting enough that I would return to it a lot, which is why I'm comfortable giving it an 8. As far as after the game's release, Laura was also asked if there were any talks of a sequel, but she states those talks never occurred. Even if there had been talks though, I doubt they would have had the opportunity to make it, since shortly after the release of Spider-Man was the video game crash of 1983. This negatively impacted Parker Brothers, who then decided to leave video games behind and return to focusing on board games. Due to the crash, we also missed out on an Atari Hulk game, which was planned to release in July of 1983. The crash caused the game to be cancelled, with only minor glimpses available regarding what it might have looked like. One scan shows a screenshot of a level and describes the gameplay as a tri-level environment where you play as Bruce Banner as he attempts to rescue his girlfriend Betty Ross. Along the way, you'll pick up gamma charges which turn you into the Hulk, allowing you to fight creatures in your path. This sounds like it could have been a really fun game, so it's a shame that it never saw the light of day. But anyway, I think that concludes this video on Spider-Man for the Atari 2600. If you're interested in trying it for yourself, it's pretty easy to do on your computer. I just downloaded an emulator called Stella, which also has info on how to find and download these games. The gameplay you saw throughout this video came from the Stella emulator, and I even played it using an Xbox One controller. I'll leave a link to Stella in the description as well. Also in the description will be a link to the full video interview with Laura Nikolic on Spider-Man Crawlspace. I'd highly recommend checking it out, since there were so many fascinating details within it that I couldn't fit into this video. Also, if you enjoyed this retrospective, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like, since that helps out the channel and you can subscribe if you'd like to catch future retrospectives as they release. This was my first time doing a retrospective on a smaller game, so I thought I'd try a more freeform format compared to discussing a game in chapters. So I'd be interested to hear your feedback about how you feel about this format for smaller games, and if you'd like to hear about more smaller scale games like this in the future. 
As far as what's coming up next though, that will be the conclusion of the Batman Arkham Knight retrospective series, which will be much longer and more in depth compared to today's video. If you haven't seen it yet, part 1 of that video is already available to watch, as well as videos on the other games in the Arkham series. If you're here for Marvel though, I have plenty of Marvel retrospectives in my backlog, including multiple Spider-Man games. We're not done with Spidey yet though, as I still plan on covering plenty more of his games in the coming months. First up will be another retro classic, Spider-Man on the PS1. I've been excited to take a stroll back through that game for quite a while now, so I'm looking forward to covering that video next. So stay tuned for more on that, but for now, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.